So this evening we're talking about gut health. What is it and how to improve it? Gut health, a condition where food goes in the top and the residue goes out the bottom smoothly with little or no back talk. Okay, that's my definition of gut health. <laughs> that's very scientific. Isn't that what we all want? We eat the food, it goes down, it doesn't bother us, it comes out, it doesn't bother us coming out, and we're all happy. That's gut health. Uh, and gut health results from an interplay between diet, gut microbes, emotional state, and the functioning of the organs of digestion, which include the gut, that's mouth to anus, the salivary glands, the liver, the biliary system, the pancreas, the teeth, all of that, that's, that's the whole thing. You know, it's one of the most complex systems there is in our body. When I was in medical school, we had a, a teacher, his name was Frederick Saunders, a gastroenterologist, and he said, a good set of bowels is worth more than brains any day. <laughs> And if you've ever had an upset stomach, you know the truth of that, right? Yeah. And uh, so we find out, though, that the brain and the gut are intimately connected. Uh, the ancient Greeks thought that the uh, feelings were centered in the gut, and we laughed at them until recently when we found out they weren't so wrong because you have a billion nerves are about that in your gut. That's as many as you're in your spinal column. So um, maybe the Greeks weren't so far off. And the expression gut feeling is actually uh, fairly accurate. And so go with your gut is not a bad way to express the importance of our gut. All right, well, what are the major functions of the gut as you are demonstrating right now, one of them is to digest and absorb nutrients. If you can't digest and absorb nutrients, you're in trouble. You have to go on total parenteral nutrition. That's getting all your food through the vein. And that, that'll work, but you lose a lot of pleasure in life, don't you? Because eating is one of the pleasures of life. That's one function of the gut. Another is to educate, modulate, and participate in immune system function. So the gut educates the immune system, it modulates the immune system, and it participates in function. Well, what does the immune system do? Well, that's another lecture I'm giving uh, in two weeks. But um, if we can meet publicly then, uh, the immune system basically works like our border patrol for our country. It has to decide what's you and what's not you, and in the not you category, what's dangerous and what isn't dangerous, okay? And the gut assists in that because the gut has the largest area, surface area, where things enter our body. Uh, as it says there, if you took the gut, pulled it out, and ironed it out on a big area, it would cover an area 10 to, uh, sorry, 15 to 20 times as big as your skin. So the lining of the gut is bigger than your skin outside by 15 to 20 times. That's about 30 to 40 square meters of surface area in your gut. Uh, so it's, it's a big organ and it contains the largest amount of lymphoid, that's immune system, uh, tissue in our body. It's really the center of our immune system as you'd expect it to be. Where's the border patrol? It's on the border. Does everybody have a sample that would like a sample? Raise your hand if you don't. Okay. Oh dear. I'd say give them a double portion for being so patient. Yeah. Okay. So uh, then the, the third function of the gut is to modulate brain and emotional function. Did you know that your gut modulates your emotional state? Yeah. 
That's why the, that old saying, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, right? You keep a man well fed and he's, he's going to treat you well, right? They're pretty simple machines, those men. <laughs> yeah. It modulates brain and emotional function and here's an, in, uh, an uh, illustration of that. Gut microbes produce 95% of the body's serotonin. You know, we have a whole class of antidepressants called serotonin reuptake inhibitors for depression. Well, maybe we ought to throw those out and feed people better because there's some good evidence that if you eat well and your gut's happy, it really helps depression. Uh, helps prevent it, helps reverse it, and I'd rather eat really good tasting food than eat pills, wouldn't you? Yeah, I don't get much pleasure in swallowing pills, so I try to stick with food. Um, and the other thing we found is if you change the microbi microbial population composition, that is you change the uh, amounts of different bacteria, you actually can treat mood. And uh, that's, that's interesting. You didn't know that those bugs down there were causing you to feel happy or sad, but they do. So it's important to uh, treat your inner uh, zoo, we could call it. Did you know that you have more microbes in your body than you have body cells? Yeah. So you're beginning to wonder who you are, right? <laughs> Yeah, and you have more DNA that's not you than is you, in, inside you. Uh, so treat it, treat it well, it's, uh, it's important. All right, so what are some evidences of a healthy gut? Number one, no reflux. Anybody like reflux? I uh, know, we don't like to be like cows. They do that all the time. They kind of chew their cud, right? Anybody like to chew their cud? Not me. Yeah, so no reflux, that would be evidence of a healthy gut. No abdominal pain. I, you know, I see people with abdominal pain all the time. Nobody likes it. Little or no distension. Ever had distension and you felt like you were a dirigible? Yeah. Yeah, nobody likes that. So we'd like to avoid that. Manageable gas. I didn't say no gas. I said manageable gas with little or no disagreeable odor. Now, you know, let's face it, we all pass gas. Anybody here that don't, that doesn't? Yeah, I didn't see any hands go up. So we all do it, but you know, you, you can do it quietly usually, and if it doesn't have a, a, you know, a tag on it telling you other people what it is, who cares? Um, it's natural. Uh, and, and if you eat in such a way that your gas is manageable and doesn't have a, a remarkable odor, big deal, right? We're all human. And, but if your digestion isn't working well, then you start getting those fragrances, shall we say. <laughs> all right, the other thing that's an evidence of a healthy gut is relatively effortless BMs regularly. I see lots of people and they're complaining of too many or too few or too hard or you know, on and on it goes. We won't go there after you've eaten. All right, an acceptable body weight. Why do I say gut function gives you an acceptable body weight? Because we now know that at least in animals, and some evidence in humans too, if you take the microbiome from a thin person and give someone who's overweight a fecal transplant, they tend to lose weight. Because believe it or not, your microbiome does a lot to tell you when you've had enough to eat or not. And so, you know, if you're overweight, you can just say, it's not me and it's not my problem with self-control. It's those darn bugs that are telling me to eat more. Yeah. And there's some truth in that. It's not the whole story. Willpower still plays some part. You can say no to your bugs, but it's nice to have a good microbiome so that weight is where it needs to be.
All right, so let's look at fiber, microbes, and butyrate for a few minutes because this is very important to having a healthy gut. Microbes have <clears throat> more than 20 enzymes that you don't have and they digest things that you can't digest. A good example of this interplay is termites. Termites eat wood, but they can't digest wood. They have to have a microorganism in their gut to digest wood. Now we can't digest wood, and neither can the microbes that you know, are in our guts, so don't try it. But with termites, that's true. They can't, if they didn't have microbes in their gut, they'd die. Same's true with us, only we're not eating wood, but we're eating fiber and other carbohydrates that are indigestible to us. And if we didn't have microbes in our gut, we'd get no benefit from them. And so it's important to have those microbes doing their digestion of those carbohydrates. And in the digestion of carbohydrates, they produce short chain fatty acids, one of which is butyrate. And butyrate is a really important short chain fatty acid. It's very active in our bodies and I have a list there on your handout of all the things that butyrate is known to do. If you have high butyrate levels, you'll have better insulin sensitivity. If you have nice high butyrate levels, you will increase your metabolic rate in your body. And you know, I, I like to have a high metabolic rate because then I can eat a little more and then I don't get so cold on cold days here in the winter. So having a good metabolic rate is a good thing. Uh, butyrate can signal the liver to reduce the production of cholesterol. You know, you thought it was just the cholesterol you eat, but it's not. The majority of the cholesterol in your body is cholesterol your liver makes. And if you have a nice high butyrate level, then your body makes less cholesterol, your liver does. So um, that's important to keep in mind. Uh, butyrate can induce apoptosis of cancer cells that are lining the colon. So if we have high butyrate levels, we'll have less risk of colon cancer. It reduces inflammation by down-regulating the immune system. It's like when the, the immune cells lining the gut have butyrate sent to them by these microbes, it's like everything's cool here, just relax. There's no foreign invaders coming, you know, just chill instead of being on high alert. You know, as I mentioned, the immune system is sort of like the border patrol. And if you send a message to the border patrol, look, there are a whole bunch of terrorists coming to, to try to cross the border tonight. We want you on high alert. If a non-terrorist showed up there, would there be a chance of collateral damage? You bet, because that's an inflammatory condition. The same is true with our gut. If our gut is on high alert, there's more inflammation, more damage than if the butyrate is there and saying, hey, everything's cool, relax, no, no uh, terrorists coming down the, the pike tonight. So we want to keep that butyrate high. Butyrate lowers the pH of the colon contents and that enhances mineral absorption, particularly calcium, which is a good thing and it tightens the junction between the cells lining the gut which reduces inflammation and reduces the incidence of leaky gut some of what some of you I'm sure have heard of leaky gut and having high butyrate uh, in the colon helps prevent leaky gut well how do we get butyrate well you get butyrate by feeding the colon fiber the colon the mac I should say feeding the microbes fiber if you send fiber down the pike, then all of these good things happen because butyrate production ramps up. You hear about fiber as being good to lower cholesterol, and it does it by two mechanisms. One, in the upper gut, 
fiber binds bile, which is cholesterol rich. And that bile then goes down through the gut and is excreted in your stool. That's one mechanism. And the other me mechanism is fiber eaten by or digested by the microbes signals the liver not to make so much cholesterol. And those are two reasons why fiber helps lower your cholesterol and lower your risk of heart disease. Any questions so far? Covering a lot of material here. Yes, in the front. What's question. That, that word you use? Uh, A -P -O -P -P Apoptosis. What does that word mean? It means death. Death of the cancer cells. That's where they pop. A pop tosis, you could say. How about that? I just made it up, but it works. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now let's get into ways to have a healthy gut. All right. Enough talk about one. What can we do to have a healthy gut? Number one. Yeah. You're already laughing. You read it. Yeah. It's like the most important thing that you can do to have good health is choose your parents carefully. That really helps. And, and you want to choose a mother with a healthy gut who will birth you vaginally and breastfeed you. You want both. Now, I have three sons and two were born naturally and one was born via C-section. And guess who has the allergies? C-section. Why? It has to do with the gut. And he didn't get all those nice, you know, bacteria from mom's vaginal canal. And as a result, his immune system is a little more active. But you can overcome that if you're not too cleanly with your kids when they're little, if they're born by C-section, you know. Um, don't be too cleanly. Just give them good bacteria from mom. Um, we don't need to go further down that road. All right. And breastfeeding is really important. Why? Because in breast milk, there, there's not fiber, right? But there are oligosaccharides that the upper gut does not digest. They're digested in the colon and they make the bacteria there very happy. The kid picks up bacteria from mom at birth See, they're in a sterile environment in the womb and they don't have any bacteria, but coming through the birth canal, they pick up those bacteria and then with the mother's milk, they get food for the bacteria, the oligosaccharides. You might be interested to know that now there's a product that's just come on the market for people with up upset tummies from a bad microbiome and it's called Holigos. That's shortened for human oligosaccharides. They're now manufacturing them. They're not taking mother's milk and, you know, refining it or anything. They're manufacturing human oligosaccharides and they help people with uh, dysbiosis and uh, problems with their gut. But that goes right back to mom. And uh, if you were born by C-section and have irritable bowel syndrome or something like that, you might want to try to retrace time and try some. They're over the counter, you can buy them online. So, I guess they're not over the counter, they're online, yeah. There are no counters online, are there? Just checking, all right. So, uh, after that's done, because we really can't go back there, I want you, number two, to eat regularly on a schedule from the start. Well, we're sort of back to kids. If you want your kids to have good digestion, have them eat regularly on a schedule from the start. And as an adult, two to three, three times daily and avoid snacking. Now what does that have to do with the gut? Well, very simply, they did a study uh, some years ago with nurses. They took them and they gave them the usual American breakfast, coffee and a donut. <laughs> and, and, and then they, gave, they were a little hungry mid-morning, so they gave them a snack. And then at lunch they weren't very hungry because they'd had a snack and so they didn't eat a whole lot. But then they were hungry mid-afternoon because they didn't eat much at lunch so they gave them another snack. And then they hadn't eaten well all day so they had a big supper. No one here eats that way I know but you may know some people that do. And, and then what they did is they pumped their stomachs. 
And what do you think they found? Breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, and supper. Because the stomach is a little bit like a washing machine. It has to go through a cycle. It has to reduce the, the particle size down to a certain uh, size in order for digestion to occur. And it's just like the washing machine. If you started it and then threw some more clothes in and started the cycle over, you wouldn't get complete cleaning and you don't get complete digestion if you're snacking like that. And so what do you think that stuff smelled like and was like when they pumped it out of the stomachs? It had been sitting there all day. It had been chewed. Was it digesting sweetly? No. Would you have wanted to smell their gas on the other end? No. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because you wouldn't have digestion, you'd have decomposition through rotting. And some of you know what that's like. You felt kind of rotten inside and I would recommend to you that you try eating regularly with five hours between meals and for most adults two meals a day is enough. You don't like to hear that I know but if you're going to choose two meals a day eat breakfast, don't skip it. You say, I'm not hungry at breakfast? It's a real simple thing to fix. Don't eat supper. You'll be hungry at breakfast. <laughs> yeah. Breakfast and an afternoon or noon meal, and you'll be surprised your body's designed for you to eat that way. You can do that very nicely, and most people who have an upset gut, if they'll just do that, their problems improve a lot just eating two meals a day on a regular schedule. Did you know that clams open their little shells to feed within 15 minutes of high tide every time the tide goes high, twice a day? They're really regulated. We're not, because we're not as smart as clams, but um, try eating regularly on a schedule from the start and as an adult two to three times a day. Chew your food thoroughly. No one here I know rushes through a meal. You all have plenty of time. But uh, if you know someone that doesn't chew, tell them to chew their food thoroughly. Why? Because if you don't chew your food thoroughly, it's going to sit in the stomach longer because the stomach's got to chew it and it's hard to chew without teeth, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's what happens. Drink adequate water, but minimize your fluids with your meals. Because if you drink a lot with your meal, you don't chew. You just wash it down, and there we go. If you don't chew, then your stomach chews, and then you're going to have reflux, and you're going to have problems. So chew your food thoroughly. You want to drink the adequate water, but not at mealtime. Drink it 30 minutes before meals, uh, or more, or two and a half to three hours after meals. Um, avoid eating in a hurry. Avoid too much variety at a given meal. Can you imagine how difficult it is to sort out all the meal that you eat at Thanksgiving and digest it? I mean, that's a complex business. And if you could get like five or six different kinds of food and then some dessert on top of that or two or three, your body has an awful time digesting all that food. So keep it simple. Try keeping your food in, in batches, shall we say, that digest relatively the same amount of time. For instance, fruit digests much more rapidly than vegetables. So if you have trouble with your gut, try putting fruit at one meal and vegetables at another meal. It's much easier on your digestion to do that. You'll find that grains are somewhere in the middle and so they can go with fruit or vegetables but uh, try to keep them separate and you'll do a little better. Uh, number uh, eight, eat a high fiber diet. Uh, but if you're on a low fiber diet, increase the fiber slowly. Why? Because if you're on a low fiber standard American diet, you've got one population of microbes in your belly. And if you suddenly switch to a high fiber diet, you're going to be some uncomfortable because your microbes aren't the right ones to digest your food. Now everybody's into probiotics, but your gut will take care of itself if you eat correctly. 
because those foods that are high in fiber come with their own microbiome. We don't stop and think about this. Anyone ever made sauerkraut? Okay, now sauerkraut is made by the action of lactobacillus, right? Did you add lactobacillus to the cabbage? No, why not? It's already there. All the brassicas, that's, you know, cabbage family, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, all of those already have lactobacillus growing on them. That's why they're so good for us. And if we eat those, like if you eat this salad you had tonight, you got lactobacillus on that. It would have been even more if you had gotten it fresh from your garden and chopped it up and had it raw, uh, then you would have even gotten more lactobacillus. But if you eat a high fiber diet, it's amazing how quick you shift to a microbiome that is rich in lactobacillus and other good bacteria that will help you. Uh, so increase that slowly though. I've had people go on flax meal, which is a really good thing to do, but if you start with two tablespoons after never having eaten it before, you will probably call me up and say, why did you recommend that? I feel like a blimp. Yeah, because you get so much gas and misery. So increase it slowly. If possible, grow some of your own fruits and vegetables. And if, if you can't do that, eat locally. Why? Because you're going to get the right microbiome that you need. Plants have their own microbiome and you don't have to wash it too thoroughly if it comes out of your own garden and you know your soil. Because that microbiome, that did you know that plants send 60% of the carbohydrates they make to their roots to feed the microbiome in the soil? Until the time of fruiting. If you have a tomato plant, it's growing and you see the top part and it's making carbohydrates and different things to grow the plant, it's sending 60% to the roots to feed the bacteria that feed it. Plants and us are very similar. We need this microbiome to feed us and it pays to feed it. And so if you take a plant out of your own garden, it's going to be rich in these, microbiome, these uh, microbes and it's better than probiotics. Uh, probiotics are wonderful, but it's difficult to know which ones have in them what they say they do. There's a very poor correlation between what's on the label and what's in the pill, unfortunately. All right, so there's gardening, uh, plus it gives you some exercise. Who's planting peas in a few weeks? Come on, plant your peas, all right, good. April 1, or you could probably do it sooner. We're having a warm spring. 15 days, okay, so plant those peas. Peas are wonderful, yeah. I'm gonna have mine out April 1. <clears throat> Avoid glyphosate, why? Glyphosate was first, do you know what glyphosate is? It's the active compound in Roundup, okay? Glyphosate is a great weed killer. Well, sort of. But it was first marketed as a boiler cleaner. Easy, easy. It was first marketed as a boiler cleaner. That is, it's a chelator. Chelates minerals. But it wasn't very good at that. And then it had antibiotic uh, properties, so they patented it as an antibiotic. And it's pretty good antibiotic but then they found that it was a weed killer. And so it kills, yeah, it had, a, it had sort of a circuitous route to fame. And, uh, and so it is a fairly good antibiotic and it will disrupt your microbiome. So I, I say avoid that whenever possible. Do you know that every person they've ever tested in our country for glyphosate has had it in their urine? It's everywhere. But the foods that are the highest in it are corn, soy, potatoes, and wheat. 
So you want those organic when possible. You, you can't always get them organic, but when possible, get those organic. Um, you'll notice that I have a little um, in parentheses there, and that is you may consider ancient grains in place of wheat if you have persistent GI distress. Our wheat has been modified uh, to some degree, and some people that have irritable bowel syndrome think that they're gluten intolerant when they're not. It's the change in the wheat that they can't tolerate, but they can eat red, white, red fife wheat or kamut or um, einkorn without any GI distress. And there we go back to GMO changes and what they've done to wheat. But that's just an aside for those of you that aren't tolerating wheat, that's something you can do. <clears throat> Avoid artificial sweeteners. Why? Because many of them kill bacteria. Aspartame is metabolized to formaldehyde. Is that good for bacteria? No, it kills them. And um, the xylitol is fine, except it kills bacteria too. That's why the dentist wants you to chew it after meals to kill the bacteria in your mouth so that uh, you won't get dental caries. But you're far better off to get the right bacteria in your mouth. There was a recent article that my daughter-in-law, who's a dentist, showed me yesterday and it, people that have greens regularly, preferably daily, and fruit daily have a much better microbiome in the mouth and way lower risk of dental caries. So eat your fruit and eat your greens for your teeth. That's important. Uh, number 12, avoid clothes that are tight or constricting around your abdomen. That isn't as big a problem as it used to be, but um, when women wore really tight clothes. If you're having a real problem, gentlemen, wear suspenders. Ladies, hang your uh, clothing from your shoulders. That really helps. You know, your bowel is not static. It moves all around. And if you wear real tight clothes, it can't move and you get more problems. Uh, number 13, strive for good cheer at mealtime. If you're not happy, take a walk until you're happy. Sometimes that's a long walk for me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's important to be cheerful at mealtime and, and choose a place to eat that's relaxing. You know, often our dining rooms, uh, you know, have windows that we can look out. Don't eat over your desk if you're stressed at work. Get up and move and go somewhere else where you can relax. Why? Because when you're stressed, your body produces epinephrine, which cuts down the blood flow to the gut. It prepares you for fight or flight, and not for digestion. You need those feed and breed um, uh, nervous system to kick in, and that's a whole different paradigm of hormones. So. Don't eat when you're stressed and look for a happy place or at least happy people to eat with. Um, and don't eat when you're fighting with your spouse. <clears throat> All right, light exercise after mealtime aids digestion, particularly if you have a tendency toward constipation. Take a walk after you eat. Take antibiotics, 15, only when absolutely needed consider probiotics after antibiotics. And number 16, practice intimacy with people who have healthy guts and healthy weights. That's a nice one, except not during epidemics, right? <laughs> but you know, it's interesting, uh, when a couple gets married, their microbiomes are quite different. Or I should say, when a couple got married years ago, now they cohabit, so by the time they get married, they're all the same. But when you start practicing mean, intimacy with someone, you, you share about 80 million microbes with a good kiss. 80 million. Yeah, with a good kiss. Yeah, uh-huh. Not just a peck on the cheek kind. That's not 80 million. 
But with a good kiss, you get about 80 million bacteria. So you want to be intimate with people with healthy guts and healthy weight. And, or you may be the one that's the donor there and helping your, your spouse. That's OK. Uh, interesting. Any questions so far? Yes. All right, the question was, what about probiotics after antibiotics? Can't you just eat food? Yes, you can if you're eating food that's rich in bacteria. You absolutely can. Uh, and if you focus on that, like yogurt uh, or uh, cultured foods, you can do absolutely fine and probably better uh, than probiotics. But um, there's, some, there's some recent literature on probiotics that's a little concerning to me, and that is increased rates of pancreatitis. It seems that if you release large amounts of bacteria in the upper gut, you may get some problems with infection and inflammation. And so that's why I'm emphasizing more food than probiotics, but occasionally in taking antibiotics, you set yourself up for bacterial overgrowth of pathogens in the colon, like Clostridium difficile that can make you really sick and can even kill you. And uh, in that case, uh, sometimes it's better to risk a probiotic than a bad infection, um, but minimize your intake of antibiotics. Any other questions? I know it's a lot of material, yes. Uh, you said to minimize fluids with meals. How does that affect soups? Great question. How does it affect soups? Just don't have them too soupy. And eat some <laughs> crackers and bread with it so it takes care of it. What I want you to avoid is drinking large, you know, I, I, you go to a fast food joint and they give you a a large diet soda and a hamburger and that's a recipe for disaster. If you have four ounces of fluid with your meal it's not an issue and and don't wash your food down. The, the, uh, the liquid dilutes digestive juices to some extent but the big problem is people not chewing. So if you chew your food thoroughly no problem with soups and you usually don't, well some soups require chewing cream soups don't, but yeah. Question in the back. When you say probiotics, are you talking about yogurt, either dairy-based or plant-based, or are you talking about the probiotics? I was talking about the probiotic pills. Yogurt, of course, is a probiotic. Um, the, the prebiotics are more important than probiotics. What are prebiotics? Fiber and oligosaccharides, yeah that are not digestible by us, but are by bacteria. Feed your microbiome, it's very important. Any other question? What effect would a hiatal hernia have? <clears throat> what effect would a hiatal hernia have? Not much, uh, but we get those by uh, straining at stool or eating too much. It's too late for most of us, but um, we can tell our grandchildren or our children to avoid being constipated or yeah uh, hiatal hernias aren't as big a problem as you might think most people that have them are asymptomatic what the problem is although it is a problem the bigger problem is when you have that and reflux um, the problem with reflux of acid above the stomach first of all a hiatal hernia is stomach in the chest and that's not good, but it's not terrible. When you have acid get above the stomach into the esophagus, there is no mucus layer in the esophagus. If you could take your hand, you can't, but if you could, and stick it down and hold it in your stomach for a half an hour and pull it out, you'd be almost down to bone. Yeah, because the acid is really strong down there normally, and it should be because it protects you from infection. But you don't have a problem with that acid in the stomach because you have a mucus layer in the stomach that protects it. There's no mucus layer in the esophagus. So when you get acid reflux and heartburn, you're getting it because your body's saying to you, this is not good, change something. And you'll see on the last 
bit of that page there for gastroesophageal reflux, the things to do if you're having it. And if you do those faithfully, most people, their acid reflux will go away. Although it's hard, I know, to give chocolate up and caffeine and decaf drinks and mint and alcohol and nicotine. <laughs> but if you have acid reflux, it's better to give those up than to get esophageal cancer. And reflux causes lots of problems, including esophageal cancer. So avoid that. Any other questions? Yes. So um, I'm back to the probiotics that you were talking about. So you take them after finishing antibiotics. Is there any value you can take them while you're on? Okay, the question was what about timing of probiotics with antibiotics? There's no problem taking them with the antibiotic, but the antibiotic kills them. And so, you know, you don't get as much benefit. It doesn't hurt to. Uh, but for sure for a week afterwards if you're going to do it or or yogurt and plant-based yogurt works great and you can make it very easily in your oven anybody made yogurt so easy just get a, a yogurt culture and then get some sort of plant milk you can even use um, millet ground up into a kind of soupy mixture and you add some probiotic to it and put it in your oven with the oven light on. And leave it for 12 hours and you've got yogurt. And if you want it thicker, get a yogurt strainer and it'll make it thicker. And, uh, or you can do it in an Instapot, that works really well too, on yogurt setting. Who would have thought? Yeah. <laughs> Question. Okay, apple cider vinegar for reflux. Uh, there is some sense to that, but I would not do it. Uh, why? Well, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me when you're trying to prevent acid from coming up that you're going to do it by pouring acid down. But the sense of it is often people have reflux because they don't have enough acid in their stomach, so food doesn't digest well, so it lies in the stomach for an extra amount of time and then it refluxes. So that makes some sense. I don't, I don't recommend it because I don't want to burn people's esophagus. And vinegar is acetic acid and it will burn. If you have any doubt, just put your hand in it for a while and then feel your skin. You'll feel the, the little uh, fingerprints dissolving off. And it's not, you know, it's kind of slippery and nice, just like Clorox, but if you keep doing it, it's not good for you. Uh, so I don't recommend that. What I recommend is, all right, so chew your food thoroughly, eat thoughtfully, follow this, and it usually takes care of it. <clears throat> Question in the back and then in the front. Yes. What about organic stevia or stevia? And what will it do to the gut? I don't recommend it, and the reason I don't doesn't have to do with digestion but when you have artificial sweeteners your brain tastes the sweet on your tongue thinks carbohydrates are coming and when you don't get them it stimulates your appetite to eat more you're better off to eat carbohydrates in the first place it's hard to trick your brain yeah i used to say stevia was okay and then i read some recent research and thought well better off to have maple syrup and it tastes better and it gives you something to do this time of year. You can't garden, but you can collect sap. <laughs> I could use some help right now. We're boiling it down. <laughs> All right. Question, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, avoid trigger foods. What are the trigger foods? Okay. So everybody is a little different on the trigger foods with acid reflux. Some people it's onions. They don't digest them well. Some people it's tomato. Uh, and so you have to play that yourself. Some people it's peppers, uh, pardon? Case by case. Yeah, case by case. We're all a little different on that. And I think I saw a hand in the, yeah, right here, in the back. How do you know when you have acid reflux? You don't always know, but almost always there's some burning in the chest. We call that heartburn. 
Uh, you can have acid reflux and not know it and have a chronic cough. That will do it too, or chronic uh, nasal congestion because acid can come up and burn the uh, nasal passages at night while you're asleep. But most people have heartburn with acid reflux. All right, well, one more question. Back up in number 10, the way Clay Foss said they say where, where does that come from in the pool? Is it, uh, the Glyphosate is used extensively as a weed killer between corn or uh, other crops, and it is also used as a burn down. For instance, if you have potatoes and you want to harden the tubers so that they're better for the market, you kill the potato vines with glyphosate and then uh, the tubers harden nice and they're not damaged and transport as easily. And they, of course, absorb glyphosate. And so we use a lot of glyphosate here in Maine with our potatoes, and that's why I say get organic potatoes or grow your own. The same is done with wheat. They burn down the crop, kill it, so that the kernels will be harvestable a little bit earlier rather than continuing to grow. So. You want to get organic in those foods that I mentioned to lower your glyphosate level. You can also get it, of course, if you spray Roundup on your lawns and that sort of thing.